Well, hello my lords and ladies, and welcome to Crusader Kings 2 A Game of Thrones, my new Let's Play series for CK2. So guys, it's been a very long time since I've played some Crusader Kings 2. I have been playing it very frequently in the past couple weeks though, because I just got the very new DLC, the Way of Life DLC for Crusader Kings 2, which is a really cool DLC just for about 8 bucks that adds a really nice amount of new flavorful um, roleplay things, and adds the ability to select a focus. For your characters, but I will be talking about that once I get into the game and once I get into this Let's Play because I can show you all the features of that. Um, but because of that, I have decided to do a new Let's Play for, for Crusader Kings 2 and I decided to pick the Game of Thrones mod for the CK2 game. Um, game of Thrones is probably by far my favorite fantasy universe uh, or the Song of Ice and Fire if you read the books. And also, it's this mod is probably one of my favorite mods among all any mods that I've played before and probably my favorite Crusader Kings 2 mod. So I decided I was going to play it again and uh, have some fun with it. So um, I've already created a custom house guys because um, I like to use, I, I don't really like to play the basic houses that the game provides in any Crusader Kings 2 game. Uh, game I play. I don't like to play the preset ones. I like to make my own because it gives them a sort of identity and things like that. It makes me feel more attached to them. So I created a house called House Guile, which I'll be actually making in here uh, in just a moment. I've added actually a small wiki page that describes the upbringing of House Guile and how they came to be because I felt I needed to explain how they had been created in this Game of Thrones uh, game we're going to be doing. So if you guys take a look in the description below, there's a little link that's going to go to a small wiki page where I have a uh, description of the setting we're going to be playing in, and also a background uh, description of our first character in the Guile Dynasty. Okay, so without further ado guys, let's get into single player. So when you get into Crusader Kings 2 Game of Thrones, you actually have three major starting dates. You have Aegon's Conquest, which is the start date where Aegon Targaryen, the first of the Targaryens, has actually come over to Westeros with all of his dragons and his armies and decided to set out and conquer the land and put all, bring all the lords to heal and make himself king. We're not going to be doing that. That is a very cool game mode though. I highly suggest playing that if you want to have some fun with dragons because the game does have dragons you can use. Um, you have Robert's Rebellion, which is during Robert Baratheon's uh, rebellion against the Mad King Aerys Targaryen, and also the War of the Five Kings, which was over here just a minute ago, which is the war uh, that you all who have seen the TV show might be more familiar with, because that's the war where uh, Robb Stark, uh, the Lannisters, and things like that are all at each other's throats and fighting. But we're going to be picking, actually, a start date that's going to be two years after Robert's Rebellion, so we're actually going to click on Custom Start Date, which actually brings up quite a lot of new ones. Uh, but we're going to be playing at the Crown Stag date, so I'll read the description to you guys before we get in. So Robert's Rebellion is over. The Targaryens are all but wiped out, their last scions scattered to the free cities in the form of a young man and a babe in arms. Robert Baratheon now sits on the Iron Throne of Westeros, but soon realizes that being a king is quite not as so easy as he expected. Honor! I've got seven kingdoms to rule. One king, seven kingdoms. Do you think honor keeps them in line? Do you think it's honor that keeps the peace? It's fear. Fear and blood. So, basically, Robert's Rebellion is done, and we're going to be starting off in the aftermath, which is where um, my house uh, has actually come to be and had its first fortune. So we're actually going to be playing as the High Lord of Strong Song in the Vale, which is an area that's actually kind of nested away in the Vale that owns... Um, these three territories and that they're actually kind of nested in the mountains here. It's actually a very nice area, very comfortable, and I feel like it'll be a pretty easy place to, or I don't know if that's really easy, um, but it'll be a pretty nice place to start. So, all right, but let's go into the ruler designer. Uh, I'm going to be making my character very quickly. I've already decided what he's going to look like and what my house name is and traits and all that. So this won't take me that long at all, I promise folks. So he's going to have some light brown hair, actually dark brown hair. And he is not going to look like that because that mouth, I don't know what's going on with that. That's just weird. Um, my character is actually going to have a bit of a smile on his face. Let's see. Okay, that looks good. Uh, eyes are fine. That's actually, it's funny. All of my characters, I usually make them look like this just because I like this basic look in my opinion. Um... Because I, I think I've had like three characters I've made that look like this, so... Anyway. Um, now, Game of Thrones, the mod, actually has a huge amount of surcoats. So you can see they have 824. Now, I originally didn't know that you could... I thought you could only cycle through them one at a time. But for those of you guys who may be wanting to look through all the uh, emblems before deciding which one you want, just hold the control key down and left click on the arrow, and you'll actually go through them uh, 10 by 10. It's a very easy way to um, go through all of these without too much trouble. Now, I already know what kind of emblem I want. I'm actually going to be having this basic one 
but I think it looks very nice. It's very clean. Um, I'm going to be having a white sword on a blue background. Of course, we'll see the sword once I change it to white. I actually really like this. I think this is a great... Um, yeah, I think this is a great crest, and it goes very well with my house's motto, because every house has a motto, which is, uh, in our case, it is uh, We Are the Power. I was stuck between that and a couple other ones, but um, I felt We Are the Power kind of fit this very well, because my house is very determined to rise above all the rest and be the highest house possible, and owe their allegiance to no one. So. Okay, so my house is going to be the House of Guile. So we're going to be the Guile Dynasty, and our first ruler is going to be named Andros. So let's go in here and pick our traits. So Andros Guile is actually going to be a very, very good military leader and also a very cunning man. Um, so let's go in here and pick the traits that I had. So he does have a few bad traits, of course. Uh, Lustful, for one, which actually isn't really that bad, depending on what your opinion is. Lustful can be very nice because even though it, it makes it so you lose prestige monthly and you get a small negative modifier hit to your opinion with other church vassals of yours, it gives you extra intrigue and also gives you extra fertility, which means you'll have children more quickly. But it also makes you more prone to uh, have affairs and things like that, which can lead to your wife trying to kill you. Which can happen, <laughs> which is also why the Game of Thrones or the Crusader Kings 2 game is so great because your wife can try to assassinate you. Um, okay, so Andros also is very ambitious. We'll throw that in there, and he has—he's a very good military leader. Um, based on his upbringing as a knight in the Vale over here, uh, he was trained in military training in the Vale, so he's actually a very good organizer, which gives him an extra bit of movement speed to the army he's commanding and also makes it so he retreats more quickly. He also is a very aggressive leader, uh, which has advantages and disadvantages. He, His armies that he's leading will have a negative modifier hit to defense, but they'll also be, do more damage and also be better at pursuing enemies. He also is a mountain expert, which makes perfect sense because the area uh, where he's actually currently governing over is surrounded by mountains, and also most of the Vale is mountainous. So, um, He is also a authoritative figure and very... I'm missing one thing. Ah, I remember. Um, he is also very selfish and stubborn, and he owns a Valerian steel sword. Hang on, I'm missing something. Master Schemer. Oh, yeah. That's right. There we go. Okay, so this is what our character is going to be looking like. So he is a very lustful person. He is ambitious, which gives him a plus two opinion, or a plus two modifier to all of his traits. But it also makes it so um, he, uh, for any any vassal who's also ambitious of his, is actually going to, or actually not any vassal, but just any other person who's ambitious is going to have a negative opinion of him. Uh, we also talked about these already. He is also a very authoritative figure, which this is actually um, a custom uh, trait that's added by Crusader Kings 2 Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones adds a lot of custom traits with all their unique modifiers, which is really cool. Authoritative gives you plus one martial and plus one diplomacy. When this character speaks, they speak with a natural authoritative tone. He's also selfish, which gives me extra stewardship, but also because he's selfish, it makes it so my spouse and also my dynasty like me less. He's very stubborn, which lowers his intrigue and his learning by one. Uh, and also it gives me a minus five opinion penalty with anyone who is also stubborn. He has a Valerian steel sword, which is a very cool thing. And the nice thing is, is actually later in the game, I can spend some gold to reforge this and change the name to whatever, to something else. And it'll get a custom uh, new icon here, and it'll give me even more prestige. And I'm going to be doing that later. Uh, but it gives me an extra martial skill, it makes me better in duels, and also gives me extra prestige. I'm also a master schemer, which gives me plus three intrigue and a legitimized bastard, because Andros Guile actually started out as the bastard lord of some lord in the Vale, and he was legitimized and then given this cut of land after his uh, service in the war against the Mad King. So this is going to be my character, guys. Uh, he's pretty good. He's got very high martial skills and very high intrigue skills. Now, if you guys are going to be playing this game um, and you want to try to min-max things, um, I would really suggest that you go for stewardship because stewardship is actually very nice because what this actually does is it gives you it makes it so you have the ability to hold on to more territories and directly rule more uh, territories in the game Crusader Kings 2 Game of Thrones actually restricts you a lot 
And while I'm chatting, I'll start this. Um, it restricts you a lot because in um, the base Crusader Kings 2 game, you can own a very high amount of territories depending on your technology level and also depending on your character's stewardship skill. But in this one, if you have like 18 stewardship, you'll be able to rule like two provinces. In the base Crusader Kings 2 game, if you have 18 stewardship, you could probably rule four. This game makes it very hard for you to directly rule multiple areas, um, so stewardship is very important. But um, because I wanted to make a guy who had a lot of martial traits and also intrigue, I kind of forego uh, forewent that just for the time being. So, okay. So before we get started into the game, guys, let's talk about um, some of the unique things about Game of Thrones, this mod in general. Uh, the mod has been out for a very long time, probably a good year at this point. However, um, I'm going to treat the beginning of this Let's Play like you've never played the Game of Thrones mod. Now, I will not baby uh, the entire series because I'm assuming that most people who are watching this have played Crusader Kings 2 at some point. If a lot of people do want a tutorial story series, let me know in the comments below and I will make a separate series of tutorial videos to talk about Crusader Kings 2. Um, but I'm sure most people know how to play this game at this point. So, the Game of Thrones mod, it obviously changes the Crusader Kings 2 game into the Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones universe. Uh, very recently, a couple months ago actually, the mod developers added the rest of the Game of Thrones universe. So instead of just being Westeros right here, which is what it originally was, there was actually the entire world all over here now. It's fantastic. So there's so much more potential for expansion and for unique cultural interaction. War between the two continents is great. Uh, there's so much stuff. We've got Astapor down here, Mirian, uh, New Gis. We've got Ashai all the way over here. There's so many nice things. It's really cool. Um, yeah, so then you also get a lot of different, you know, custom flavorful events and things like that uh, for the game. The, um, for one, you will notice that there's actually no technological advancement, and the developer's reasoning for this is that um, Game of Thrones, the Game of Thrones universe is very um, kind of stagnant in its, medieval, uh, in its medieval time period. There's not a lot of technology advance, uh, technological advancement that goes on, so because of this, there's actually no technological advancement. So, like I said, this makes it very hard for you to get a lot of bonuses that you would you'd be used to getting with your vassals because you can get, you know, majesty and things like that, which gives your vassals extra opinion of you and things like, you know. You can also increase your demand size with technology, uh, but you can't do that in this game. Demand size is completely governed by stewardship, so. Um, we also, if we go to council, you guys will notice that we actually have a very new council screen. Now there are a few council members that basically do the same functions as they did in the original game. Uh, the Master at Arms pretty much does the same thing. However, you also can assign him to train your children, which has a chance to actually um, improve a children, a, one of your children's uh, combat prowess, or make them hate it, lowering their martial ability. So it's kind of cool. Uh, you also, the Justicar is basically your Chancellor. Uh, you have a Spy Master still, he does exactly the same things as he used to. Uh, you also now have a Septon, which is your priest, essentially. Um, he can perform charity, which I think these are actually in the game already. So he can perform charity, he also can uh, try to convert people. The Maester is actually, his only function is to serve as a teacher for your, uh, your children. So you actually can't assign him to anything. You can just assign a Maester and then that's it. So, um, and then the Castellan is kind of a combination of a steward and also a diplomat, at the, or and a marshal at the same time. Um, Castellans are usually in charge of castles and um, upkeep of areas and things like that. So, all right, but let's, uh, you know, first off, let's assign my council. That's always the first thing you want to do. So I can see here that my highest stewardship person is going to be uh, Jellion, a courtier. So we're going to assign him and my Justicar. Let's see. So we have Nestor, a courtier, again here. He is a dutiful commander charitable slot. Okay, so he doesn't have any negative traits. You always want to, when picking your council members, uh, especially your spy master, um, you want to make sure the council members you're appointing do not have any um, traits that could make them rebel against you. So for instance, like you want to keep an eye out for ambitious or like, you know, um, plotter, things like that, you know, schemer. Um, because if you put a vassal like that on the, as one of your, um, council members, especially if you put them as a spy master, it makes it so they can be in a very high position to uh, actually do you some great harm, because the counselors actually have a lot of prestige and a lot of uh, ways they can manipulate your kingdom. And then, let's see, so this person is authoritative, cynical, shy, and envious. This person is greedy. However, they are just. So because they're just and also they're gray eminence, I'm going to assign Morton 
as my uh, spy master. And okay, there goes my court. So now my court is assigned. Let's actually assign them all to my territory and strong song right here. So the Castellan has four options. You can have him oversee the province, which gives you uh, a bonus to tax, so you get more money, and also makes it so you build things more quickly wherever he's assigned. You can improve the defenses of the area, which improves the fort level, and also the garrison size, making it so the area takes longer to be besieged. You can pacify the province, which lowers the overall revolt risk and gives you more reinforcements, or you can improve the holding that you're currently building which you can have a success or a failure based on the uh, Castellan skill. So because we're not at war and we don't need a ton of troops, I'm going to be overseeing the province of Strong Song so I can get a lot of gold. Um, next up, let's go to my Master at Arms. My Master at Arms can either suppress revolts, which will give me an arrest chance bonus, uh, local and it'll reduce local revolt risk. He can train children, or he can train troops, which gives me more men. Um, he These... We don't have any revolts going on, and we also don't have any children, so train troops is going to be the most applicable thing. And then my treasurer can either oversee construction, which reduces the local build time of the area, or he can get me more money. Obviously, I want more money, but we're not building anything right now, so we'll do that. We're going to try to milk as much money as we can as Strong Song. And then my spy master, let's see. So it looks like both of my vassals like me for the most part. Lord Loris is a little iffy with me because he's at a negative two opinion. And I think the reason for that, why does he not like me? Oh, he just doesn't like me because I have the uh, short rain years penalty. This The short rain years penalty would go away. Every a character starts with that for a little while and it decreases every year. So Lord Loris should like me after a decent amount of time. However, I'm going to scheme over here just in case, which will make it so I can uh, have an increased plot discovery chance, which will give me a little bit of plot protection against uh, any evil plots against me. And then my Septon is going to perform Charity and Strong Song, which is going to lower the local revolt risk and also give me a chance to impress my vassals, gaining some opinion, and also improve my overall piety. Those are good. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's... Um... So right now the game is telling me I have no heir to my dynasty, and if I die, I lose the game essentially because I have no heirs. And then it's also telling me my ruler is unmarried, I need an ambition, and also I need a character focus. So... Let's pick an ambition first, because right now, I want to get married, so we're going to pick the ambition Get Married, which once I complete this, um, I will actually gain a good amount of piety, which is always good, especially since um, I actually am only gaining about 0.13 piety per month. And now, here is the first new feature of the Way of Life DLC, the Focus ability. So in the early CK2 game, um, you have the ability to actually select individually if you wanted to, like, you know, improve your martial ability, improve your stewardship or things like that, if the um, ability was below 8. That's how the game originally worked. You would pick an ambition and you would say you wanted, your ambition was to improve martial, okay? However, with the addition of the Way of Life DLC, that has been eliminated. And now the way that you, the way you actually improve your stats is that your character picks a focus. He picks a thing that he wants to focus on for five years. You can change your focus every five years. And what he does is he picks this focus and it gives him a different bonus and also gives him um, flavorful events based on the focus he picked for a certain amount of time. So there is business, which gives you plus one stewardship and also an extra opinion bonus with your city vassals. Rulership, which gives you plus two stewardship. You can see here that they're actually grouped together uh, somewhat. So you can, most of these actually, um, these focuses have to do with one another. We have intrigue, which gives me just a flat plus two intrigue. Seduction, <laughs> very nice. Um, gives me plus one intrigue and also 12.5 extra fertility and also some more sex appeal. And like you guys can see, some of these actually unlock new, um, what is it, new plots. So for instance, if I were to pick Intrigue, you guys can see here that it says this focus unlocks the spy on option for suitable targets. So if there is a target that I can actually spy on, while I have this Intrigue focus activated, I can actually spy on them and gain information from them. And if I pick uh, Seduction, I also can try to seduce people, which is pretty cool. We're going to be taking advantage of this a lot because I want to see how this freaking seduction works. I think that's really cool. Uh, we have hunting, which gives me an extra bonus to martial and then also health. War, which unlocks the dual action versus rivals and foes and gives me extra martial. Uh, Corrosing, I believe it's pronounced. Um, I probably mispronounced that. I'm sorry about that. Um, this focus unlocks the ability to invite other people uh, against suitable targets, okay, and gives me extra diplomacy. Family, gives me extra diplomacy, extra fertility, and extra health. 
And then theology gives me extra learning and also an opinion boost with vassals, with temple vassals. And then scholarship gives you an extra plus two learning. Now the first thing I'm going to be going for is family, because this improves my diplomacy, making me more amiable, and also it improves my fertility and my health, meaning that I'll be more resistant to disease, I'll live longer, and also I'll have an extra fertility bonus, which is always nice. So we're going to pick that. And then now that we've done that, the next thing you, I want to do is I wanted to arrange a marriage. So when picking your first marriage, guys, the first thing you want to do is you really want to figure out, okay, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a marriage? I'm actually going to change the um, regions to this, by the way, guys, just off topic for a minute, because I think this looks cooler because you get to see all the seven kingdoms. Anyway, um, what was I saying? So when you're picking your first marriage, you either want to try to do um, kind of like selectively breed your characters and try to look for the woman with the best traits because um, your parents have a chance to actually pass on a lot of their genetic traits to their to their kids which is you know it makes sense kids they move their they pass I mean kids get some of their parents uh, abilities and things like that later so um, you can do that or you can try to marry politically I'm gonna be marrying politically for this case because I want to actually try to advance myself and become the king of the or the Lord Paramount of the Vale which is all of this territory and the way I'm gonna do that is I need to actually get some um, allies, some powerful allies, or I need to marry into the family of the Vale. Now currently, um, John Aaron is actually, he has no kids, he is currently married to Lysa Aaron, um, which, or Lysa Tully, uh, now Lysa Aaron, who is actually sister to Catelyn Tully, the uh, wife of Lord Eddard Stark, um, up in the north. He has no children, uh, his first daughter has died as a stillborn, and his current heir is actually this guy, Harold down here. Now, the Aaron family is kind of has this really weird, like, messed up lineage, so the only heirs they really have left at this point are um, the Wainwoods down here. If we look at their family tree, let's see, pretty much all of the Aaron family has actually died at this point, which is quite sad, um, but, you know, it works in my favor, because that means there's more opportunity for me to become king of this area, or become lord of this area. So, if Harold and uh, Teresa die, the throne of the Vale is actually going to be up for grabs. So right now, uh, since there aren't really that many people in the family of the Vale to marry and also gain blood relations with, I'm going to be looking for other people around here. Now, one option I do have is uh, Lord Eon of Eastwald. I can marry his daughter who is an expert scientist, where if I have her as a wife, I will gain a 10% national tax modifier bonus, which is great. Um, she actually does not have very high stewardship, which kind of sucks, but she has very high learning, which your wife will actually contribute half of her stats to your overall realm um, diplomacy. So you currently have your character's stats right here, their traits. And then these are actually directly contributed to your overall realm statistics. And these determine things like how much money you gain, uh, how effective your intrigue is, and also how much men you get, depending on how high your marshal is, and also um, how large your demence is, which means how many territories can you directly control. So picking a wife with good stewardship, or picking a wife that can actually supplement your bad traits. So for instance, for me, that's uh, diplomacy, stewardship, and learning is very nice. Um, so let's see. So this Jane's Hunter is an option. She doesn't give me very good stewardship, but she'll give me a decent amount of diplomacy and also a decent amount of learning. Um, let's look elsewhere. So Lord Yon of Runestone has one 13-year-old daughter. Um, now I would technically, if I married this girl, I actually would gain a very powerful alliance because Lord Royce holds a um, duchy of five territories actually. Um, this is actually a very powerful alliance, but because this daughter um, is actually not of age yet, and I would have to wait till I'm 29 to marry her, I'm not going to be waiting for that. Uh, that's just going to take too long. So my only option here really is going to be Lord Eon's daughter. So I'm going to be making a political match here, which actually turn, won't turn out to be too bad, um, just because she has a lot of learning and she has some decent amount of diplomacy. I would have liked to pick someone with more stewardship, but that's okay. Oh, I forgot. I can pass on my sword to her. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because actually family members inherit um, 
your Valerian Steel Swords once you die, and you actually can choose to pass them on to other people if you want to uh, give the sword to someone else who isn't a family member. That's kind of cool. All right, so I'm going to arrange a marriage between the two of us. Okay. And I think that's going to be all the preparation I need. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this little introductory part, guys. There was a lot of preparation and stuff like that going on. Uh, next part, we will jump into the game in full. I hope you guys enjoyed this part. Uh, leave any comments and questions you have in the comment section below. And have a great afternoon, folks. See you later.